camera there. <laughs> Joe, it's uh, our pleasure to introduce Michael Rumford from Bonn, uh, who's uh, going to talk about the arithmetic transfer conjecture for exact fit for model like that. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, also for the invitation to speak here. It's a pleasure to be in Bonn. <laughs> has been in the last 10 years. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about uh, this subject. And these are essentially ideas that all originate with Wei Zhang. And they're all related to the harmonic analysis that comes from the relative trace formula. And this harmonic analysis is modeled on the harmonic analysis for the usual trace formula. And uh, before I start, I want to recall uh, what the transfer uh, means in this old context. And let me explain in the case of uh, the quaternion algebra and GL2 over QP. So you have the quaternion algebra and GL2 over QP. These are inner group algebraic groups which are inner forms of each other. And there are two steps to this procedure. The first step is you s take two regular semi-simple elements, one in GL2 QP and one in the quaternion algebra, and then you say that these uh, elements match if they have the same characteristic polynomial. And uh, uh, one checks that every element of a quaternion al algebra matches some element in GL2. The converse is not true, but doesn't matter. And then in the second step, you say that a function on GL2 QP uh, matches, no, not matches, is a trans, uh, is, how do I say it? Is it a, um, is related or is um, associated <laughs> to a function on the quaternion algebra if the orbital integral of these two functions at elements which match are identical. I identical up to a factor, and this factor is called the transfer factor. Okay, and so uh, what I'm uh, uh, starting out with is explain the analog in this, uh, in this context, but you don't have to know anything about the harmonic analysis, really. So notation will be as follows. So P is an odd prime. I take a finite extension of QP, which I call F, with a ring of integers OF, uniformizer pi, and residue field K, which is isomorphic to FQ. And then I take a quadratic extension, and I use similar notation. So I have OE, then I have uniformizer prime, I have the residue field K prime, and I have the Galois automorphism, which I simply denote by A goes to A bar. The next notation refers to a Hermitian space. So let W be a Hermitian space for this extension. Um, of dimension n minus 1. The reason I call this n minus 1 is because I want to enlarge this by 1. So I call w tilde the space that I obtain by adding one vector, which is orthogonal to w uh, and is non-isotropic. And uh, uh, once I have this, I can <coughs> form the following group, or f form the uh, following pair of groups. Namely, GW is the unitary group of uh, W tilde, and this <coughs> contains in the obvious way U of W. And this, uh, I, the reason I'm writing this from the left and the right is because this group HW acts from the left and the right on GW. 
and we are going to talk about uh, uh, the orbits uh, under the left and right action of this group. And so the first thing is I have to say what the analog is of regular semi-simple in this context. So definition, an element of, uh, sorry, wait a minute, uh, I made a mistake here, sorry. Uh, I meant here to take the product of u of w and u of w tilde. And the embedding is the obvious one, namely it's the identity in the first component and the obvious embedding in the second component. Okay, so an element of GW is called regular semi-simple. Okay, and before I say what it means, let me recall one possible definition of what it means to be regular or semi-simple in GL2. Namely, one looks at the conjugation action, and then an element is regular semi-simple if and only if its orbit under conjugation is to risky closed, and the stabilizer is as small as possible. And so we are just going to mimic this definition. So in other words, the orbit of G under this product group <coughs> is to risky closed and of maximum dimension, or in other words, a stabilizer and with minimal stabilizer. Okay, and uh, if I have such an element, which is regular semi-simple, and the function p infinity with compact support, then I can associate to it its orbital integral. So this will be the thing that uh, we will match in the end. Namely, it's simply the orbital integral over this double uh, orbit. Okay, so this explains one side of this comparison. And now we go over to the other side. I mean, uh, the other side is more like the GL2 side. I mean, of course, this analogy is not perfect, but this is somehow like the uh, side that we have on the quaternion algebra in the usual uh, uh, setup. Uh, and now we come to the case of GLN. And here, I consider the following analog here. So I call this H1 prime contained in question? Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I produce another triple like this. And here I take the following. In the middle, I take restriction of scalars from E to F of GL n minus 1 cross GL n. On the left, I take restriction of scalars from GLN minus 1. The embedding is, the ob is identity in the first factor. And for the second factor, we just uh, view this as matrices, which have a 1 in the right lower corner. <coughs> and here on the left side, I have the obvious embedding of GLN minus 1 plus GLN. And so I have another triple. I can again define what it means to be regular semi-simple. And again, I can form an orbital integral. But in the comparison, it will not be a usual orbital integral, but it will be a twisted orbital integral. So 
for gamma in G prime of F regular semi-simple <coughs> and F prime a function with compact support. I define the following integral and actually I will also want to consider its derivative so I also introduce a complex parameter and I introduce the following orbital integral so it starts out as before h1 minus 1 gamma h2 but now I weight this <coughs> um, with a determinant of h1 prime to the s and eta of h2 prime dh1 prime dh2 prime where eta of h2 prime means the following so I mean h2 prime has after all it has two components let's call them H2, I don't know, there's a prime already, maybe 1, and H2 prime 2. This means the following. You take the quadratic character corresponding to the quadratic extension E over F to the n minus first power of the determinant of the first component. And then you do the same thing, but to the nth power for the second component. Okay, and then <coughs> uh, we are going to be interested. Uh, so this complex parameter, as I said, is just introduced in order to be able to talk about the derivative. But for the orbital integral, we just do the same thing as here. There's no complex parameter, so I just call this O gamma uh, F prime. So this is just the value at s equal to 0. And then I want to talk about the derivative. This unfortunately adds another prime. So this, of course, has a different significance. O gamma prime, f prime, is d by ds. O gamma. Okay, so now I have defined these two sides, and the next step is to say what it means that a regular semi-simple element in the on the first uh, board matches a regular semi-simple element on the second board. I don't want to explain this in detail, but just say that there are one way of doing this is <coughs> a, a generalize this notion of characteristic polynomial. So uh, there are numerical invariants associated to these elements. One is their characteristic coefficients of their characteristic polynomials. Another one is you take this vector u that you added and you pair it with its translate under powers of g. And uh, uh, you can imagine, you do, do the first, I think, n minus or 2 n minus 1 as such numbers, and you can match them with the corresponding thing on the GLN side. Uh, so this is just some. A technical thing, and it uh, it won't come up in, uh, later in the talk, so it's not necessary to know this in detail. But in any case, yeah. No, no, not at all. No, this is a completely different setup. Okay, so there is a notion of matching. between elements of GWF regular semi-simple and G prime of F regular semi-simple. And so we denote this 
by G matches gamma. Okay, and now there's this fact which is somewhat surprising. So I will denote by, so let's recall that there are two Hermitian spaces of dimension n minus 1 up to isomorphism. Uh, they're distinguished by their discriminant, and so I denote by W0 the split Hermitian space of dimension n minus 1, of course, and by W1 the non-split. So these two spaces are not isomorphic, but any Hermitian space is isomorphic to precisely one of them. And uh, <coughs> There are two facts, namely A, let I be either 0 or 1, and G be an element in GWI of F regular semi-simple. Then there exists a gamma uh, which matches G. So this is a complete analog of the thing for GL2. But what is more surprising is that conversely, let gamma be regular semi-simple, then there exists a unique I and a G inside GWI of F regular semi-simple which matches gamma. So this is really different from the classical situation. Okay, and then the next step is that I can copy this definition of associated functions so in other words, functions will be associated if they have the same orbital integrals on matching regular semi-simple elements. And here, since this matching involves, uh, so since starting from gamma, I can always match this element with some unitary group. Uh, I will actually say that a function on the big group, on the G prime group, matches a pair of function. So this is the following definition. Let F prime be a function on G prime of F and F zero comma F1 be a pair of functions on G of W0 of F cross G W1 of F. And then we say F prime is associated to this pair F0, F1, if for all i 0, 1, and all g wi of f regular semi-simple, we have that O gamma of f prime is equal up to this factor, which I will call omega gamma, um, sorry, if OG, I want to put it on this side, of FI is equal to the transfer factor of F prime whenever gamma matches G. So this uh, factor omega gamma 
is the transfer factor. This is another big difference to the classical situation. In the classical situation, it's very difficult to give the transfer factor. But here, in this case, this is a very simple sign factor that I could write down, but it uh, doesn't add to the story somehow. Yes. <coughs> right. Well, no, I mean, uh, this gamma, I mean, this gamma encodes the eye because, after all, there is a unique eye to which this is matched. So, in this sense, it does depend on eye. Okay. And so, now I can formulate this conjecture. Um, I make the following hypotheses. Let E over F be unramified. And I assume that the length of this added vector is a unit. And furthermore, let F prime be the characteristic function of the obvious uh, maximal compact subgroup of G prime. So I will just denote this by K0 prime. So in other words, K0 prime is simply G prime of OF. OK. And then the conjecture says, first of all, F prime is associated to the pair of functions, which is the characteristic function in the zero component, and it's zero on the one component. And here, k0 is the stabilizer of a lattice inside this Hermitian vector space, which is self-dual for the Hermitian form. Since W is split and E over F is unramified, such a lattice exists, and they're all conjugate. And so I just pick one of them. And then if I add this vector, since I'm assuming that the vector has length a unit, this is again a self-dual lattice. And for K0 tilde, I just take the stabilizer of this other self-dual lattice. <coughs> OK, so this is the first conjecture. So CA. There must be something missing here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. OK. So this means, what does it mean? If I take a gamma, either it's matching with an element in the non-split Hermitian space, in which case the orbital integral is simply 0. This is what the, the second thing means. Or else it matches with an element in the split space, and in this case, this twisted orbital integral of f prime over gamma is equal to this untwisted orbital integral uh, uh, on this split space. OK, and then the second part is um, let g be now an element in W1. So this is one, the kind of element that is uninteresting from the point of view of the first statement. So let this be matched with an element gamma. Then I know that the orbital integral is 0 by the first statement, so I can look at its derivative. And here's this conjecture. This is up to the same sign factor equal to something I will denote like this. <coughs> uh, 
Um, okay, so this, the derivative of the orbital integral is equal to this quantity. And so now I have to take some time to explain what the right-hand side here means. So, uh, <coughs> I mean, it's obviously the second conjecture. So, I mean, I should say that this conjecture here is essentially due to Jacquet and Rallis when they worked on the relative trace formula. It's a variant of it. Whereas the second part of this conjecture, this is what's called the arithmetic fundamental lemma, and it's due to Wei Zhang. And on Doesn't matter, it's a sign. sign. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, on the right hand side, as I will now explain, this is an intersection product on a formal moduli space of p divisible groups, and obviously, this is why I became interested in this whole thing, because uh, this I find exciting. So. Raum was uh, being able to transmit all his excitement about his stuff, so I would try to do the same. <laughs> huh? Before you go on, yeah? how deep is the first conjecture? Okay, I will say something about what is known about this after I explain the right hand side. Okay. Now, both conjectures are very deep, actually. So, uh, if you think that the Arith the uh, automorphic fundamental lemma is a deep statement, then you also will agree that this is also a deep statement. But it is a little easier. For one thing, uh, this, uh, this transfer factor is much simpler. <coughs> but I mean, I should say that Valsberger pointed out to me that there is this called the extraordinary fundamental lemma on the automorphic side. And uh, uh, for this also, the sign factor is very simple, and yet the statement is very deep, and uh, it was proved by Ngo. So, uh, and I don't think the proof is easier than the other case. Okay, so now I want to explain the right-hand side. And for this, I will assume for simplicity that uh, the field F is simply QP. Okay. So I would denote by milp the category of schemes over the ring of integers in the maxima and ramified extension, such that P is locally nilpotent in the structure sheaf. And then I denote by N n, this of course depends on this extension e over f, uh, I will denote the following functor, z-valued functor on this category, namely to s I associate the set of isomorphism classes of quadruples x yota lambda rho, where x is a p-divisible group Formal p-divisible group of height to n over s by yota, I mean an action of OE on x, which satisfies the uh, Cutworth condition that already appeared in uh, Ben Howard's talk. So, in other words, the characteristic polynomial of A acting on the Lie algebra of X should be equal to T minus A times T minus A bar to the N minus 1. Then lambda is the principal polarization 
whose Rosati involution induces on OE the non-trivial Galois automorphism. And finally, Rho is a rigidification of X by which I mean, or a framing, by which I mean that if you reduce modulo P, so I call this S bar, then you have a quasi isogeny uh, <coughs> to the constant P divisible group. So this is a quasi isogeny which is compatible in a suitable sense with Yota and lambda. And here x is just any, uh, any triple like this, which is defined over fp bar. And then one shows that this is unique. Uh, I mean, maybe a super singular, such that this is super singular. So in other words, uh, as a p the underlying p divisible group, this is simply you take the p divisible group of the super singular elliptic curve over fp bar and with its, uh, with its action by OE. And then you take n minus 1 copies of the same p divisible group, but with a conjugate action. OK. And for this, uh, for this uh, tuple, you have, so to speak, the obvious uh, uh, polarization, the obvious action, and so on. OK. And uh, let me recall a lemma that was also mentioned in Ben Howard's talk. Namely, first of all, so I mean, I should say that this functor is representable, representable by a formal scheme. over spiff VP variable. And I will denote the scheme by the same symbol. And then there's the following lemma. First of all, <coughs> this is formally smooth. Of relative dimension. n minus 1 over spiff Zp breve. <coughs> and secondly, if I look at the underlying scheme of this formal scheme, then this has a Bruyatitz stratification That was described in more detail in Ben Howard's talk. So the strata themselves correspond to the vertices in the Bruyatitz um, in the Bruyatitz building of the automorphism group of this uh, uh, framing object X, and the individual strata are all <coughs> the linear Lustig variety over finite field corresponding to unitary group of odd and an odd number of variables and a Coxeter element. So. Uh, uh, in particular, the dimension of this reduced locus um, is the integral part of n minus 1 over 2. OK. And uh, a corollary of the first statement is that the product, which I call n minus 1 n, So I formed this product. I mean, this is the thing that comes up in this formula above. This product is regular of dimension um, 2 times n minus 1. Right? This is because 
I mean, this is of relative dimension n minus 1. So this means the, the total space is of dimension n. Then this is of to this total space is of dimension n minus 1. And then we are subtracting one dimension because we are taking the fiber product over spec z dp breve. And so it all up, uh, adds up to 2n times n minus 1. OK. And now we look at the following uh, map. from this space of corresponding to the integer n minus 1 to the space n, n namely simply we have this uh, four tuple in particular we have this framing so let me forget about the other entries we just multiply this with the canonical lifting of this super singular elliptic curve and this action of oe so we just multiply this with uh, y bar and then there's this obvious framing that we have because this, uh, we have this framing object both phase y. And so we just map this to this thing. So in other words, we are just tagging on a rather simple p divisible group. And this is, in an obvious way, a closed embedding of formal schemes. And uh, uh, so then I can uh, make the same thing as in the very beginning. I would denote by capital delta the map that I get into n minus 1 comma n, uh, which is the identity in the first component. And is this map little delta in the second component? And uh, uh, the, the good thing about this is, is But if you look now at the dimension of these two spaces, you see that the target space has dimension 2 times n minus 1, and the uh, source space has dimension exactly half of it. So in other words, we are looking at a cycle in the middle dimension of the space. And this is good because in the middle dimension, we expect to be able to uh, intersect two cycles in the middle dimension and get out a number. Note, by the way, that this, I mean, why are these unitary groups so interesting? This is because if you look at the automorphism group of this uh, framing object, in other words, the automorphisms that respect the yoda and the lambda, you will get a unitary group, and it's a non-split unitary group. And this translates into the fact that this here is equivariant for the embedding of H W one of F into uh, H into G W one of F. Okay. And so I've now almost defined the right hand side of this conjectured equation, namely Now define what I call delta n minus 1 comma g times delta <coughs> n minus 1. I just call this. So first of all, there's a log q in front. This is just because when I derive this function, I get this log q in front. And then I take the intersection product in the sense of SGA6. So in other words, I take the Euler-Poincaré characteristic 
on the ambient scheme of the image of delta tensor product with the structure sheaf of G times delta. And one checks that this is a finite quantity if G is a regular semi-simple element. Okay, and so now I've explained both sides of this conjecture. And so let me first state the theorem about this conjecture. So the first statement is called the fundamental lemma. This is true for n2 or 3. And it's also true for p much larger than n. <laughs> so this here is, uh, can be done by hand. This has been done by Wei Zhang. And this other statement is much deeper. It's due to Yun. Or rather, what he did is he imitated the proof of Ngo in the function field case. And then there are these logic methods uh, which tell you that you can transfer this to the piadic case, but uh, for P, which is not specified with respect to N. OK, so this is the first theorem. And the second theorem is that this is true. for n equals 2 or 3. This is again Wei Zhang. And it's also true <coughs> if p is bigger than 2n, but with very strong restriction on the g. So g has to be minuscule. This means that it is, uh, it's very close. To, I mean, it's still regular semi-simple, but on the other hand, it's very close to the identity somehow, or maybe very far away from the identity. Anyway, so these uh, are elements which are very close to the shore. So this is in my joint paper with Tastige and uh, Wei Zhang. OK. So now, in the remainder of the time, I want to, uh, so maybe I should say one uh, reason that um, uh, all these things work is that in these cases, this intersection is non-degenerate. So in other words, I mean, in the usual geometric context, this would mean that the intersection is a finite number of points. So you, you would expect that generically, if you take at random two cycles of the middle dimension, then they should intersect in a number of points. And for all these cases that we were able to treat, this is, a, this is true. And I think it's a big challenge to go beyond this case. And uh, instead of accepting this challenge, I now want to branch out and uh, talk about this exotic uh, um, case. OK. Um, let's see. Where am I here? Three, four. OK. So um, the first exotic modular space arises um, when it goes away from the assumption that the polarization be principal. So I shouldn't really erase this, but for space reason I will erase it. But you should keep this in mind. 
So I mean, this module, the first modular space were these quadruples, uh, p divisible group of this height with an action of O e and this cutwidth condition, and then there was a polarization whose Rosati involution induced the non-trivial Galois automorphism. And then I imposed on this polarization to be <coughs> principal, and this is an assumption that I now want to drop. Uh, but not arbitrarily, but in a controlled way. Okay, so let me introduce this first exotic moduli space. Um, so I g still assume that E over F is unramified. Um, but I now take the added vector U to be of length pi inverse. And then I define this new modular space, which I maybe call n tilde. This is x yota lambda rho. Everything as before, but the kernel of lambda should be contained in the pi division points of x. But I mean, I took Q, uh, f equal to qp, so it's just the p division points. And then the size of this should be as small as possible, but non-trivial. So in other words, q squared. OK. And then there's the a following lemma, which is the complete analog of the previous lemma. So this was actually proved by Kudler and myself in a different context for different reasons, but I can use it here again. So first of all, until uh, has some stable reduction, of relative dimension n minus 1 over the base. And in fact, locally, formally, the local rings and closed points are isomorphic to um, CP Breve, then you have two indeterminants, x and y, divided by x times y minus p. And then you add to this the number of variables that you need. So I think it's x1 up to x n minus 2. So in other words, it's just a, uh, formally speaking, it's a, double a curve with a double point multiplied with the smooth variety. OK, so in particular, and until uh, is regular of dimension n. And the second statement is that this reduced locus has a Bruyatit stratification. Which again means that we have strata that are enumerated by the Bruyatit spilling of the automorphism group of the framing object. And the individual strata are uh, the linealistic varieties associated to <coughs> unitary, group, unitary groups. Uh, uh, and coxeter elements, but this time the unitary groups are in an even number of variables. So before it was in an odd number of variables, now it's in an even number of variables. And then there is something that I don't understand, namely 
uh, so even number of variables, for instance, could be zero. This would correspond to the, a stratum that is a point, but it's this stratum is suddenly blown up into a P1, into a, a projective space of dimension n minus 1. So it looks as if something is blown up uh, uh, inside a space that seems more natural. But, I mean, this is how it is. I mean, we calculated this many times, and this is definitely correct, okay? Um, What do you mean by non-smooth? Ah, yes. Um, yes, right. I mean, these are the points where this big P n minus 1 hits the other Guyatit strata in their closure. Okay, and the corollary that is important for us is that n, n minus 1 n tilde be the fiber product of the usual space with this new space, then the space is regular of dimension 2 times n minus 1. So the same as before. But for a different reason, and uh, uh, it's somehow a happy accident that here we are multiplying this variety which has semi-stable reduction with one which has smooth reduction, so therefore the product is still regular, whereas if I would multiply two semi-stable ones, it wouldn't be regular anymore. And regular I need in order to form the intersection product. Okay, and so now we can imitate the previous thing. We have this delta. Namely, we just take x rho and we multiply it with a very simple object. And so now I have to write down what I take as a polarization. So the action is obvious. This is how I, I indicated this with a bar. But now I take the polarization, which is given here by this polarization, but I precompose it with yota of pi. <laughs> so in other words, I'm, I'm multiplying this with something that has a non-principal polarization, but the kernel, of course, is minimal because this p-divisible group is very small, and so it satisfies the condition <laughs> that I imposed. And then similarly, I have this capital delta, Right. And then, of course, I have also this delta that goes into this corresponding product. Okay. And now I can formulate the conjecture. says, first of all, there exists a function f prime that satisfies these two statements in the original conjecture. So in other words, that is matched with this pair of functions. So this was this. Uh, uh, being transfer of this pair of function, which is this characteristic function of this stabilizer of uh, self-dual lattice in the first co and the zero component and zero in the second component. And the second statement was that if I t take an element that doesn't uh, match, so to speak, I mean, that is, so to speak, in this 
W1 space, that then I have to take the, then I know that the orbital integral on D prime is equal to zero, so I take its derivative, and then the derivative is supposed to be <coughs> equal up to this transfer factor to this intersection product. And so I just uh, insert these two statements in the conjecture. So the basic difference here is that instead of giving this function explicitly, as in the first conjecture, I'm just saying that there exists a function like this. And the second part of the conjecture is that for all f prime, which have the property 1, we have the property 2 up to a correction factor. So there exists a correction factor such that if I form this derivative of the orbital integral f f prime, then this is equal to minus omega gamma times this intersection product plus the orbital integral of this correcting factor. Okay. So um, uh, let me explain the difference to the previous conjecture. So in the previous conjecture, uh, you had both sides of this equality were well-defined quantities. And the proofs that I uh, mentioned, they all worked by calculating both sides explicitly and comparing the results. And both uh, calculations are difficult, but you're calculating with something very definite. The difficulty with this conjecture is that you can't do it this way because the conjecture doesn't give you this function. So there's no, in some sense, there's no use taking just some arbitrary function and calculating the left-hand side. It doesn't work. So in some sense, what one should do is calculate this intersection product and then search for a function f prime that does the job. And of course, this function is not well determined. It's only determined through its orbital integrals and so on. Uh, but there are methods in harmonic analysis which describe you this uh, leeway that you have. And so let me mention that this is OK if n is equal to 2. Uh, so in this case, one can calculate. So first of all, in this case, This exotic moduli space is not as exotic as it may seem. Namely, it's simply the Greenfeld upper half space corresponding to this local field F and then extended scalars um, to the maximum unramified extension. And here I mean the one which has dimension 2. So this is the alternative interpretation of the Dreamfeld upper half space that was proved in my paper with Kudler. And in this case, uh, uh, this case has been studied by Sankaran, and he has proved this. He has checked this, uh, this, he has calculated this intersection product. You get a very simple quantity. And I asked Wei Zhang via email whether he could check whether he could find a function f prime that matches this quantity. And the answer came back within a few hours, and it's, yes, I can do it. And so in this case, we can do it, although he doesn't write down this function explicitly, but he just proves that, first of all, there exists such a function. And secondly, whenever I have such a function that does this matching in number one, you also have this, uh, uh, this identity up to this correction factor. OK. so. Uh, Maybe I should finish my uh, talk by saying that I took here this exotic moduli space uh, for the unramified extension. Of course, in recent years, we have also studied a lot these former moduli spaces for ramified quadratic extensions. And <coughs> uh, I have a list of candidates for which a similar statement should be true. I mean, at the moment, this is, in some sense, intuitive guesswork. I don't have a general principle for which of these formal moduli spaces this corresponding statement should be true. But for instance, here in this case, you could ask, well, why do I take just q squared? How about q4 and so on? 
But I'm convinced that for these modular spaces, it doesn't work. So, I mean, I don't have a good reason for this, uh, but I, it's just my intuitive feeling that it doesn't work. And for the uh, ramified extensions, I again have a list of uh, moduli spaces. And one, uh, yeah, one heuristic principle I uh, pursue with this is that uh, I try to see whether this lemma is true. So one, the first thing is that it should be at least semi-stable, if not even smooth. Okay, so this is one criterion, if it is, because if it's not semi-stable, there's no way of forming a product so that I get a regular scheme, and then this intersection product won't make sense. And then the second thing is this thing about the Brouillard-Titz stratification. So there's recently been work by Gertz and He, in which they <coughs> looked at affine de lustig varieties, which are the group theoretic uh, um, analogs of these reduced underlying reduced schemes, and they have th given an essentially complete uh, classification of the cases in which this kind of statement is true. Now, this list is not, com it's not totally complete because they have to make some assumptions, and so <coughs> whenever I have a candidate, I write an email to Gertz whether he can find on his list a case where his method works. And this is very laborious to work this out, but I'm very optimistic that whenever I suggest something like this, he will find that there is a Bouillard-Stitz stratification with the correct properties. Okay, I'll stop here. Um, okay, so I mean there are two questions here. I mean, the question is whether I can choose an F prime such that this holds on the nose by an Iwahori function. Yes, the answer is yes. But then there's also this other question that any time I have a function that ma does the matching in the for the first should also up to correction term satisfy the second, and there you can change this by by making it non non Iwahori. 